Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think we should start on time. My name is Peter Stone. I'm Professor of Maternal Fetal Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. And I just have two housekeeping matters. I'm informed that we're not expecting a fire alarm practice tonight. So if there is a fire alarm, we're supposed to meet outside in the foyer. And please, because we are recording all these uh, sessions, uh, cell phones off or on silent, please. Thank you. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome you this evening to our talks in this 50th anniversary series marking the opening of the Auckland School of Medicine. And actually we're particularly excited about presenting these talks tonight, which are good news stories about saving or enhancing the lives of our most vulnerable children. Auckland continues to be a world leader in perinatal and placental research. Indeed, we're actually also celebrating that it's 50 years ago that Professor Sir Graham Liggins, working in the postgraduate school of obstetrics and gynaecology, the forerunner of the department that our first speaker heads today, um, Sir Graham Liggins showed the effects of steroids on preterm lung function in sheep and he embarked upon one of the most important trials ever done in perinatal medicine to demonstrate steroid efficacy in human lung development and save thousands of preterm babies. Some of you may also be interested to know, particularly those of you that um, may be somewhat sceptical about committees, that the head of the postgraduate School of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, Professor Bonham, chaired the Senate Advisory Committee tasked with the details of the establishment of the medical school. It had originally been thought that the school would open in uh, 1970. However, the committee worked so well, even faster than the Chancellor Sir Douglas Robb had um, imagined, that the school was ready to admit its first students in 1968. So we are celebrating 50 memorable years tonight in 2018. Well done, Senate Advisory Committee. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Sue Brewster, who's the Executive Director of the Auckland Medical Research Foundation, to say a few words. Thank you, Sue. Now, I do just need to forward the slides, Peter. That might be a bit technical. Oh, there you go. That's a good... So if I do that... And that. Oh, it does work. Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. A little bit chilly. I think there's been a few traffic events along the way as well, so it's great to see so many of you here. And, of course, tonight's topic is saving babies, um, something that you're all interested in and that is dear to our hearts. So Auckland Medical Research uh, Foundation, our purpose is to fund medical research and of the $71 million of funding that we've awarded to research, a lot of that has gone into funding research into babies and their health. I think you'll see behind me uh, Dr Shirley Tonkin. So there's a newsletter that will be in front of you that says autumn 2016. Um, it's not because we want to give you outdated newsletters or get rid of them. It's because there's a piece in there that is dedicated to Dr Shirley Tonkin and the work that she's done um, on the third page inside. So Dr Shirley Tonkin uh, was a remarkable woman. She dedicated her life to saving babies. And she was one of three researchers who led to the invention of the foam inserts in babies' car seats, which prevented their heads from falling forward and choking. And that simple device literally has saved thousands and thousands of babies' lives um, since that point in time. Um, in that uh, piece on Shirley, there's a great uh, excerpt in there from uh, Professor Ed Mitchell of University of Auckland, and he says about Shirley and her research, Shirley has been one of the most irritating people I ever worked with. She has frequently come up with the right idea, but without any data to prove it, only to be found right after several years of research. And therein lies the beauty of research. Um, so, Dr Shirley Tonkin dedicated her life and in uh, 2016, at the age of 94, 
Shirley passed away, but leaving the legacy of saving thousands of thousands of babies' lives, and her research lives on. And also, she left a gift in her will to the AMRF so that, I guess, her legacy continues to give to the medical professional and all of the researchers uh, that will go on to do amazing work. Speaking of amazing people and amazing work, we've got uh, wonderful presenters here tonight who will talk to us about babies, um, uh, the medical treatments and research connected with that. So thank you very much to our presenters. And um, also tonight, please don't forget um, to fill out your feedback forms, which will all be in front of you. Very important to us, so we know what you want and what you want to hear about in the future. There'll also be a folder like this available for more of you out on the front desk uh, to find out more about uh, Auckland Medical Research Foundation and what we do. Thank you to all of our supporters here tonight. We simply couldn't do what we do without you. And I think you'll see up there a hundred percent of your donation goes directly to medical research. Uh, all of our administration costs are funded by a ge very generous benefactor. So you can be assured hundred percent of donation goes directly to where you want it to go. So without further ado, thank you so much. A very warm welcome and I know that you'll enjoy tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. I'd now like to uh, introduce distinguished pr Professor Jane Harding, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. It's a great honour to be here to chair this evening's lecture series on saving babies' lives and improving lifelong health. We have six speakers tonight who are going to talk about their research contributing to that vision. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes and I will introduce each one and we will simply move on after each one because we think six talks is quite a lot for you to listen to. If we have time at the end, we will take questions and if we don't, well, the speakers will be here so come and talk to them after the event. Our first speaker tonight is Professor Leslie McCown. Leslie was the top qualifying student in the fourth intake of this medical school, and she's currently head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. Her major research interest, amongst many, and the one she's going to share with us tonight, is prevention of stillbirth. In acknowledgement of her research achievements, Leslie's recently been awarded the Gluckman Medal for 2018, which is the premier recognition of research within the faculty. Please, please welcome Professor Leslie McCann, sleep position, a modifier or risk factor for stillbirth. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Jane, and it's fantastic to see so many, um, many people here in the room and so many young people as well. So, on with um, my talk. Well, my, I'm going to talk to you about um, stillbirth this evening, and that's an area that I spend quite a lot of my research time um, um, involved with. So we define stillbirth in New Zealand as the death of an unborn baby at or after 20 weeks, but our research focuses on what we call late stillbirth, which is the death of an unborn baby at or after 28 weeks. And we focus on this group of babies because if these babies are live born, we expect them to survive and have a healthy survival. And every year in New Zealand, approximately 160 New Zealand babies are stillborn after 28 weeks. So if we think about that, that's about five empty classrooms that are, that are unfilled with, um, with, with babies who have died before birth. But we have got an exciting opportunity because if we can identify modifiable risk factors, we have the potential to reduce this tragedy, tragedy for families and, and society. So what, what sort of modifiable risk factors could we think about? And it's been known for decades that the position of the mother affects blood supply. And early studies, and this is a picture from a publication in 1969, um, this diagram shows that a mother lying on her back, the inferior vena cava, which is the main vein in the abdomen, is compressed by the large pregnant uterus. And our anaesthetic colleagues have known about this for a long time. And when a mother has a caesarean section, they tip the table over to the left, almost to the extent that it's hard to reach the, reach the mum. She's tipped over so much. And they do that to try and improve the blood supply to the mother and the baby. 
So in 2006, we started a study called the Auckland Stillbirth Study, where we asked the quest a question, amongst others, is going to sleep, lying on the back, a risk factor for late stillbirth? And our cases were mothers with stillbirths in the Auckland region, and our control group were women who had ongoing pregnancies at a similar stage in pregnancy. So what did we find? And this research was published um, in the BMJ, um, and what we found was that women who reported that they went to sleep lying on their back the night before their baby was stillborn had a two and a half fold increase in, the, in risk of stillbirth. And that risk persisted after we adjusted for other common risk factors for stillbirth. Now when we published this, there was a lot of discussion and, and um, correspondence with the journal. And whilst it was thought that these findings were biologically plausible, um, People thought that there was an urgent need to confirm these findings, and that it was very premature to be making recommendations about optimum going to sleep practices for pregnant women. So we rose to the challenge, and we conducted the next phase of our research. So we uh, undertook a New Zealand-wide study. We uh, have a, a very talented team in our department who have undertaken some amazing physiological studies, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. And we also surveyed the opinions of pregnant women in South Auckland, which is our community which has the highest stillbirth rate in New Zealand. So this slide shows the results from our New Zealand-wide study. And what you'll see here is that the risk for mothers who went to sleep lying on their back was almost exactly the same as what we had found in the Auckland study, so we confirmed these findings. There's now three additional studies that have been published, and we're very fortunate that we've now got money to undertake what we call an individual participant data meta-analysis, which means that we pull the data, the individual data, from all the studies that have been done, and we can look, to look at those results in a combined study. So what did those results show? So you'll see up here that the, um, the, the odds of um, late stillbirth were very similar to what I have shown you in our individual studies. And another a, a good news story on this slide was that women who reported that they went to sleep lying on their right side had, a, had the same risk as women who went to sleep lying on their left side. So that means that pregnant women can choose which side they would like to go to sleep on. So we've got a fantastic international collaborative research group that also in involves consumers and bereaved parent organisations, and there'll be a lot of research that comes out of this IPD going forward. So having um, made these clinical findings, we now set to to try to understand the physiology behind it. And this work has been led by Professor Peter Stone in collaboration with a number of other members from our department and from the Department of Physiology. So Peter recruited 30 healthy pregnant women and looked at the behaviour of their babies in, um, when they were lying on their back, their left side and their right side, and monitored the fetal heart through the mother's abdomen. And what they found was that low activity behaviour in the baby, and we call that um, state 1F, and we can see a picture of it here, and this reflects reduced oxygen consumption, and that was much more common when mothers were positioned on their back. And in contrast, the high fetal activity state, which we call state 4F, was very uncommon when the mother was lying on her back. So this suggests that lying on the back is associated with lower oxygen behaviour in the baby, even in a healthy pregnancy. Now this work has been extended and it was led by an amazing um, BMED site honours medical student last year who has undertaken some, some magnetic resonance imaging studies during pregnancy. So Amy Humphreys led this work. So here's a mother in late pregnancy in the MRI scanner lying on her left side and here's her spine and here's the baby and this blue circle is the main vein in the abdomen that we call the vena cava. And when the mother turns over onto her back, there's almost complete obliteration of that vena cava. And there's also a reduction in the diameter of the aorta. So to summarise quite a lot of studies in, in one slide, we believe we have a, a pretty good understanding now about the physiology that's associated with maternal position and the effects that we're seeing in our clinical studies. So the pregnant uterus compresses the major vein called the vena cava, there's a reduction in the blood going back to the heart and a reduction in the output of blood from the heart. 
There's a reduction in the um, blood flow from the aorta, which is the main artery. This leads to re reduced blood supply in the placenta and low oxygen levels in the baby. And whilst a healthy baby can cope with a reduction in, in oxygen levels, a baby that is vulnerable or compromised may not be able to do, to do the same. So we, the next step for us was, OK, well, it's all well and good. We, now we've got these consistent clinical findings. We understand them. But can women change their, their going to sleep position? And the answer is yes, they can, and they already have. So when we recruited women to the Auckland stillbirth study, 43% of women reported they went to sleep on their left side. By the time we did our New Zealand-wide study, that had gone up to 68%, because at that time, we thought that left was best. And in our survey of women in South Auckland, 85% of women said they could change their going to sleep position if that was better for their baby. So we have been through a cycle of research from hypothesis generation, confirming the findings, further clinical studies, understanding the physiology. We've done a survey of women, and now we're at a very exciting stage of having launched um, a public awareness campaign, and some of you may have seen some of this information already. And this is called the Sleep On Side While Babies Inside um, um, campaign. And this work has been done in collaboration with a large number of professional groups, um, parents groups, um, um, stillbirth organisations, and we've had complete buy-in and complete agreement between all of the stakeholders involved, which is some, not always that easy to achieve. And we've had an amazing um, research team and um, incredible support from Cure Kids, who has been behind this project from the outset. So we launched this in, in alignment with our National Stillbirth Conference at the end of June. And we have produced um, information leaflets for pregnant women, and you may have one of those in front of you. Take it away if you know somebody who's late in pregnancy. Uh, information leaflets for health professionals, and we've got a video that I will show, share with you in just a minute. So the messages that we want to share with pregnant women, and these messages have been produced by our stakeholders. Going to sleep on your side halves the risk of stillbirth compared to going to sleep on your back. Start every sleep on your side, including daytime naps. It doesn't matter which side, they're both, they're both good. And it's common to wake up on your back, so don't worry about that, just roll back onto your side. And we suggest that health professionals discuss this at 24 to 26 weeks of pregnancy. Our next steps are to share this um, sleep position information and our resources widely. We're going to translate our pamphlets into other widely used languages. We're going to evaluate the views of consumers and health professionals about our campaign. And we're going to resurvey pregnant women to see what impact we've had on um, changing further changes in sleep position. And of course, there's ongoing data about stillbirth rates. So this is a little video that we have um, produced, which I would just like to just get the mouse, just to share with you, because we think it's a pretty cool um, resource. New research shows that sleeping on your side in the last three months of pregnancy helps prevent stillbirth. It's usual to change position while asleep. The important thing to remember is to start on your side. If you wake up on your back, just roll back onto your side. Going to sleep on your side from 28 weeks of pregnancy means you're helping to keep your baby healthy. For more information, go to sleeponside.org.nz. final slide is just to um, acknowledge the um, funders 
who have supported this work, in particular Cure Kids, who has been there right from the outset and supported the whole journey from the initial um, hypothesis generation through to the public awareness campaign, and we couldn't have done this work without them. Also the New Zealand Health Research Council, Nurture, Mercy Barnes, and we've had funding from Australia as well for our IPD. Particular thank you to the participants. It's um, incredible that women who have experienced a stillbirth are prepared to share their stories um, for the um, you know for advantage of other um, women, and we're incredibly grateful for that. And we've also got a fantastic research team, multidisciplinary, um, from several departments within this faculty and multi-professional. So it's a pleasure to work as part of this combined team. So thank you for your attention. Our next speaker, professor, Associate Professor Katie Groom, is the Associate Professor of Maternal and Perinatal Health and the Hugo Charitable Trust Fellow at the Liggins Institute. She's a subspecialist in maternal fetal medicine at National Women's Health in Auckland City Hospital. She's passionate about improving health outcomes for mothers and babies through effective clinical trials research. And in this role, she has been the chair of the Australian New Zealand Maternal Perinatal Australasian Collaborative Trials Network, and she currently chairs the national executive of the newly established New Zealand-wide on-track network for better health for mothers and babies. Katie is currently leading the New Zealand and Australia Strider trial, part of an international consortium exploring a potential therapy for fetal growth restriction. And tonight she's gonna to tell us about developing therapies for this important problem. Thanks very much, Jane, and thank you everyone so much for coming out to, to listen to us tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about developing a specific therapy for fetal growth restriction and share with you a little bit of the journey that I've been on for the last six or seven years, um, which one it may have been quite familiar to some of you seeing it in the media in recent weeks. Um, but before I start, I'm going to introduce you to Archie. So as Jane mentioned, I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So in my clinical job, um, we see people referred to us when problems arise in their pregnancy. So Archie obviously came along with his mum, um, because he was still in utero at the time, to meet me when he was 24 weeks pregnant. His mum was 24 weeks pregnant. And the reason that they came along to see me was because Archie was much smaller than was expected for how far on he was in the pregnancy. And these charts here show that all the parameters of growth were well below what would be the expected norm for this gestational age. So I immediately made a diagnosis of fetal growth restriction. But this could be caused by a number of different things. So my job was to think about what that might be. So we went on to look at a number of blood flow patterns, both into the placenta, from the placenta to the baby, and within the baby. And what that told me, that it was likely that there was a problem with how the placenta was functioning, and the reason that Archie was smaller than expected was due to a condition called utero-placental insufficiency. Um, so what does that mean for, for Archie and his mum? Well, unfortunately, um, there wasn't any magic treatment that we could offer. We currently have no proven therapies to aid fetal growth while the baby's still inside the womb. Unfortunately, all we can do is watch mothers very closely, watch babies very closely, and try and time the best time to deliver. Because the options that we've got are to continue on in that hypoxic environment with reduced nutrient supply, reduced oxygen, and risk that risk of stillbirth that Leslie's talked about. Or the alternative option, when this has occurred really early in pregnancy, is to get on and deliver the baby. But we know then that adds further risk to these babies who are already very vulnerable. And that's not just an immediate preterm risk while the babies are in the NICU, but this is actually a lifelong risk to their health. So it's not the ideal situation, and it would be much nicer if we could offer a therapy. Now, obviously, having said that we think this is related to utero-placental insufficiency and potentially uterine blood flow, a perfect opportunity seems to be, can we increase uterine blood flow? And there's a number of potential candidates, but I'm going to talk about sildenafil, which is better known as Viagra. Um, and a lot of the work is um, first was developed by Phil Baker, who was a professor here at the Liggins for, for a couple of years um, until, I think, 2015. And this has been work that he's been doing for the last 20 years. So sildenafil is a, a drug that helps to 
dilate blood vessels. It's particularly developed for its effect on the cardiovascular and pulmonary vasculature, but it also affects the pelvis. So there's potential that giving it to mums may help the blood vessels to dilate. Um, this is a study taken from some myometrial samples taken after a caesarean section that shows if you apply sildenafil in the laboratory to these blood vessels, they do dilate. So again, giving us an opportunity that maybe it's a good thing to do. And over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a huge number of animal studies looking at the potential of sildenafil. Jo Stanley worked here at the Liggins for a number of years, and she's done a lot of work in the mouse um, model, and Charlotte Oyston did her PhD with us looking at the sheep model. And the vast majority of these studies do suggest that sildenafil increases the blood supply, increasing the placental vasculature, reducing the resistance of blood flow to the baby, and in fact, particularly in the sheep and the mouse model, increasing the growth of the baby. So... Can we use it in humans? Is it a safe thing to do? Well, actually, in my job, for women who've got a really severe pulmonary vascular condition, we already use it in pregnancy. It's a small number of women, but it hasn't raised safety concerns. And it's actually now used quite routinely in the neonatal unit for a condition called persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, which is a recognised complication of preterm birth. So Phil Baker, while he was working in Canada, worked with Peter von Dadelson, and under a specific ethical clause within their, their um, practice, they were able to offer women the opportunity to have sildenafil. And 10 women who had very, very small babies, um, at about that same point as when Archie was small, elected to take the therapy. And they compared that to 17 women who chose not to take the therapy but were happy for their information to be shared. And this is what they saw when they looked at how well the babies were growing inside the uterus. And you can see there clearly that it looks like the babies that mothers have received sildenafil grew more. And this is by measuring their abdominal circumference. In actual fact, it also looked like these babies did slightly better. They were more likely to survive and more likely to survive discharge from hospital feeling well. So what happens next when you've got this information? Well, sadly, what happened next was a number of clinicians all around the world thought, let's get on and start using this drug. And they um, published case reports. The Daily Mirror thought it was of interest. But really, having had results from 10 cases, it's not the way forward. What we need is well-designed clinical trials to answer the question. And Leslie, myself, and a few others got involved in a consortium back in 2011 with a plan that we would do a single trial across the world. But logistically, we realised that that wasn't going to work for us. So we actually split into five planned trials um, across five different countries, or for us, binational. And we made a plan in advance to do a study, like, as Leslie said, about individual participant data analysis by putting all of our data together but running our trials separately. So we'd all publish our results individually, but we'd have this opportunity with shared resources to combine our data at the end of it. And we'd have sufficient information to find out whether the drug helped to improve survival free of major morbidity. So Strider New Zealand, we were very fortunate. We were the first trial across the consortium to be funded, and we're very grateful to the Health Research Council of New Zealand for that. We were the first to receive eth ethics approval, but it did take us a little bit longer to recruit patients, and therefore we're grateful to Cure Kids for uh, the additional funding, and Gravida and Nurture, who funded some stub studies. And we were also very fortunate, 13 maternal fetal medicines, so high-risk obstetric units across Australia and New Zealand, agreed to participate in the study. We recruited women between 22 weeks and 30 weeks if their babies were incredibly small. So the criteria to enter the study, the babies needed to be at a really significant risk of a poor outcome. And then women were randomly assigned to receive a bottle of tablets that were either sildenafil or an identical placebo. And neither us, the women, or the clinicians caring for the patients knew who was taking which drug. And we asked our clinicians to watch the patients really closely and make their usual decisions on when they should deliver the baby. And for our study, we looked at the rate of growth. So were there more babies who grew quicker after having the treatment who took sildenafil compared with placebo? So it was a just yes or no, did your baby grow more? But we collected a huge um, another amount of information, which we worked with the other groups to define so we could compare our outcomes. We calculated in advance that we would need 122 women to be able to see an increase in the proportion who had an increased growth from 50 to 80%. And that was very similar to those graphs I showed you from the, um, the uh, observational data. Now, it took us three years to find 122 women who met the criteria and were willing to be randomised. Now, that doesn't sound like very many, but as I say, these were really, really high-risk pregnancies, and there's not many women that are affected to this degree. 
Um, they were severe growth restriction. These babies were recruited at 24 weeks. They were less than 500 grams when they were recruited to the study, and that abdominal circumference centile was below the first centile. <coughs> So what did we find? Well, we didn't find there was an increase in the proportion of women who had babies with an increased growth. That's a pretty crude measure. But even if we look at that abdominal circumference Z score, which is a way for us to measure that, we can see that there was really no effect on fetal growth. But what about other outcomes? Now, we did find, consistent with what we thought we might find, that for a short period of time, sildenafil did improve the blood supply to the uterus. So in the first 48 hours, we saw a drop in the resistance of blood flow to the uterus. But interestingly, when we looked at that over a period of time, it was not a sustained effect. When we looked at the outcomes for the babies, live birth, risk of having a major problem, risk of surviving or chance of surviving to hospital discharge, all of them seemed to, to go in the right direction in suggesting that there was possible benefit for these infants. Even if it wasn't affecting how they grow, then it may be having another effect. So looking there, the survival to hospital discharge free of major morbidity was 67% in those on sildenafil compared with only 56% in those on placebo. So that odds ratio approaching two suggests that if we saw the same effect in a much larger group of babies, it really would be something that was quite important. So what's the future from here? Well, we need to know whether or not, if there has been any positive effect, is it sustained through childhood? And we're very grateful to all of those funders who have funded our childhood outcome study. And all the families of the Strider trial have agreed to come back when their children are two to three years of age for a fairly detailed assessment, particularly focused around neurodevelopment. Um, we started our first follow-up in March 2017, and I can say that we have 100% follow-up of the babies that have so far been approached and offered appointments. Of course, we've got a few more that are ready for, for, for assessment and a few more that will become ready for assessment, but we've even managed to track a baby down to Scotland, and the UK Strider team have been to assess that baby for us. So our primary outcome will be survival free of neurosensory impairment at two and a half years of age. But what about the Strider Consortium? Because if we've already planned that we could put all our information together. Will that be sufficient? So we've already registered our individual um, participant data meta-analysis, and we think we'll be able to look at that survival to hospital discharge. But also the other studies are looking at the children at the age of two to three, so we'll have the opportunity to, to look there. Um, this is where we're at. So unfortunately, for um, particular logistical reasons, Ireland, after a very long battle with their ethics and their governance, made a decision not to proceed with the study. The UK, despite starting after us, outshone us and finished recruiting before us. Um, the Canadian trial has recruited 21 women, and the Netherlands have now recruited 216, but there will be no more recruits to the Dutch study. And this is where I alluded to at the beginning, because you may have all seen the stories in the media that spread like wildfire across the, across the globe. And I think this is because of it being Viagra. It wasn't Viagra, it was um, the generic preparation. But in planned interim analysis of the Dutch study after 184 participants suggested that it was potentially causing harm. Of course, that was of interest to us and to our media, and so you know, we fronted up and talked about our study. But what the interim analysis has shown was that there were more cases of persistent pulmonary hypertension, that condition that we said sildenafil is the treatment for in neonates. And there was a non-significant trend to more neonatal deaths. And for that reason, and that the study was unable to be able to complete to show a difference in the primary outcome based on the analysis at the midpoint, they made a decision to stop their trial. And the Canadians put their trial on hold. Now, I can tell you that the Strider UK trial has completed and published their results. They saw no effect on fetal growth, but they saw also no effect on neonatal death and no increase in this lung condition. Our results were presented in Pazans this year and is currently under review for publication. And again, we have seen no evidence of harm. We've only had two cases of pulmonary hypertension, one on drug and one on placebo. So where to from here? Well, it's certainly been a journey for me. <laughs> it's been a journey for our team and it's been a journey for the IPD. But we are still in the situation where we don't know what's happened. The Dutch study are going back and they're having blinded reviewers of all of their cases. As yet, this is not fully validated and we're not certain of it. We have made a, a decision to review all of the New Zealand cases. As yet, we haven't identified any additional cases under our criteria and we're pretty confident with our results with regards to that. 
And we, so we need to think about what's the difference in these results, but also to go ahead and do the individual participant data meta-analysis. It's really important if we find out that the drug causes harm, of course, but we may be in a bit of a quandary because I estimate that what we will find is that any difference is non-significant and we may not be any further forward with the potential of sildenafil, but I think it's going to be quite tricky to take that any further. But don't worry, there's plenty of other potential therapies. So sildenafil sits up there just here, but this is just even thinking about uterine blood flow. And all of these therapies are currently under investigation, most of them not yet at the clinical trials phase, but lots of ongoing work. So what I'd like to end with is just to tell you a little bit about Archie, and I'm pleased to say it's a good news story for Archie. Archie was actually Strider baby number two. So he was right at the beginning of the Strider trial, and his family were delighted to participate in the study. He received six weeks of therapy, but he did get very sick at 30 weeks, and early one Saturday morning, we delivered him by caesarean section, and he was born weighing just under 800 grams. He's almost four years old now, and he's managed to um, gain a little brother, um, and he's meeting milestones and doing extremely well and very happy to have been part of the Strider trial. So I'm going to end by acknowledging a huge number of people, but most importantly, the mothers and the babies and the families who, who took took the step to be engaged in a clinical trial of a therapy that was, was new in pregnancy. Um, we had an amazing team working here in Auckland, um, but of course a huge number of collaborators across Australia and New Zealand and around the world, and of course a huge number of funders for us to be able to achieve all of this. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Alistair Gunn, who is a paediatrician and a scientist who conducted groundbreaking basic research into the ways of identifying compromised fetus in labour. He was also working on the mechanisms and treatment of asphyxial brain injury. He was the first to show that delayed cooling could improve outcomes after babies had been exposed to low oxygen levels. He worked on how late that could start, how long it needed to continue, and practical ways of choosing which babies who might benefit. His research has helped establish therapeutic cooling as the first ever technique to reduce brain injury in babies exposed to low oxygen levels in the time of birth. And Alice is going to talk to us tonight about saving babies' brains. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight I'm basically going to t tell you a little bit about a great New Zealand success story. So pretty much all of the foundation work that led to therapeutic hypothermia was carried out in New Zealand. There's no intellectual credit, I hasten to say, because this is an idea that was first, first proposed uh, more than 3,000 years ago. It has been repeatedly suggested ever, ever since there. You see a baby uh, being cooled. You can see the little, the little cooling cap underneath uh, a little shield to stop the infrared light uh, from over, overheating the head. As one of the great ugly secrets of labor is that labor is intrinsically a, a, an experience of low oxygen levels, a hypoxic experience. So if we look at, uh, at, at um, blood flow and contractions, Here's a contraction. There is a fall in blood flow to the uterus. If you see a fall in heart rate, that means that blood flow to the uterus has, been, has fallen by more than 50%. If you see a deep deceleration, it means it's been reduced by more than 90%. So is that a problem? Well, the thing to remember is that babies are built to live on Mount Everest. So here we, you see, the, here's the baby giving us the thumbs up. <laughs> this is, my typical PO2 is about 20 millimetres of mercury compared with uh, roughly four to five times that in adults. I consume twice as much oxygen as, as an adult, but in fact I have an oxygen surplus. So babies have both a reserve uh, and major adaptations to let them survive labour perfectly happily. In fact, if they don't go through labour, uh, they adapt less well after birth. But labour that repeated hypoxia does help stimulate, it revs up the endocrine system, it gets them ready to be born. So here we, here we see the super baby flying, flying out afterwards. Now of course, not every, 
not everybody turns out well. At 0.2%, and I mean those numbers pretty, pretty precisely, two per thousand will hit the wall. But what's, what, what happens then? Well, one of the fundamental things is, is that just because there's been an excessive amount of hypoxia, it doesn't mean that the baby's brain has turned to mush at the time. Quite, quite the contrary. So this is just an example of an, of a, of an experiment. You can see here the brain waves. You can see they go up and down. That's the baby uh, showing sleep states, cycling bef before birth. This is impedance, which was developed by a colleague of mine, Chris, Chris Williams. Uh, pretty much exactly the same as the uh, way we measure fat at the local, the local corner store. So, and you can see, so during a period of low oxygen, brain swelling has increased because the cells are all depolarized. Oxygen is restored, and that partially recovers. But you can see, in fact, the brain waves don't immediately re return to normal. And there's a, <coughs> a few hours later, about eight hours later, there's a period of overactivity of the brain waves, uh, followed which by a secondary swelling, a secondary failure of the oxidative metabolism of the cells uh, and evolving changes. So what's happening is hyperactivity. You can't really tell from the outside, but if you look closely, um, that's what it looks like. You have a very suppressed EEG, repeated, uh, stereotypic, evolving, large depolarizations of the brain. That's, those are seizures. So we have a period of prolonged seizures here. And as the seizures resolve, you can see there's actually very little brain, brain wave activity left. And here you see the brain swelling gradually recovering at the same time. And if you look at the brain after here, you see severe damage. You see a severe lo loss of, of, of brain cells of various types. But what's interesting about this, OK, it's all exciting stuff happening here. There's the seizures, the brain swelling, and so forth. The interesting thing is there's a period where nothing much is happening, where actually brain activity is suppressed, and we have shown that it's being actively suppressed uh, by, by release of your protective hormones, and where the brain swelling has gone down nearly to, nearly to normal. So that's, that's a very intriguing thing. And you see exactly the same thing in babies who've been affected by low oxygen, that they, they recover initially, they, 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 sta they stabilize, and then hours later, they start to seize. So this is not, this is not an artifact of laboratory, of laboratory medicine. So the question is, what's happening in here? The next clue comes from the fact that, in fact, sick, ba sick babies get cold after birth. We spend a lot of time and effort keeping them warm. This is a, a very traditional picture, I think, from France. <clears throat> I don't know what the hat is, the hat is for. <laughs> But yes, so incubating babies, if you like. The question, though, is should we? We know there, there are, once you start looking, there are lots of clues that say that, in fact, temperature is probably very important. So this is a, a, classic, a classic one, that drowning victims were resuscitated after birth. Um, here's myself and my, my younger daughter of a much younger age at risk of, of testing that experimentally. Uh, yes. <laughs> So what, happens if, so what happens if you allow that natural cooling to occur? And the answer is, well, all sorts of interesting things. So remember, this picture shows the brain swelling. Here we have the period of low oxygen. Brain swelling happens. It partially recovers. When you start cooling here two hours later, you can pretty much completely prevent that secondary brain swelling. So as soon as we saw that, we knew something fundamental was happening. If you look at the cell, cell survival, uh, here we see severe loss if the brain temperature is kept, quote, normal, unquote. But if you start cooling at an hour and a half, actually very dramatic protection, much more than I, certainly I ever expected. Delay to five and a half hours, partial protection. But if you wait until eight and a half hours and the seizures have started, which is when clinicians would really like to wait, uh, you get nothing. So there's a time-dependent delay, but a, window, but a useful window of opportunity. Um, that five and a half hours is a practical time to realize that something has gone wrong, to assess baby, to talk to mum and dad, to get permission to, 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 um, uh, to try doing something new and unexpected. So that was very practical information. The second practical thing was that, in fact, you don't need that much cooling. We're talking roughly three and a half to five degrees, mild cooling. So this is just, just showing the relationship. Here's a normal temperature fall in brain temperature, and there's a threshold around about 34 degrees. 
Well, this has been replicated in, in lots, lots of other studies. So we're talking mild cooling. We're not talking about cardi cardiac surgery. So given all of that, uh, the next question is, is it safe? I was taught by my mother, who was this nice lady here, um, that a low temperature after birth was essentially killing the baby, that there was a tight correlation between the fall in temperature after birth and mortality on any complication you cared to look at. So I persuaded her that we should really do a trial, of, a, 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 a simple safety trial. So this is the very first ever safety trial of, of induced cooling after 3,000 years of thinking about it with a proper randomization, and it said, yes, it's, it, it is completely safe. That, in turn, uh, with experimental evidence for efficacy, uh, the, the clinical human evidence that it was safe through a proper randomized trial. Here's a proper, uh, proper commercially developed water cooler. We used a modified Fisher-Paykel cooler because we had Kiwis. Um, and the, um, the, and it was trialed in New Zealand, the US, Britain, Britain, and Canada. This, is a, this complicated figure is called a forest plot, and you, I think you can see why. It's all branch, branch and twiggy. Here's the cool cap trial, which was us, and then a whole lot of other trials, because basically people didn't believe things that happened in New Zealand, which was, <coughs> this is a good thing. The fact is this, it, may, it may hurt your feelings, but um, because they, they basically repeated the studies, um, we were able to say, right, uh, it, it, all of these studies in different countries from competing institutions found exactly the same benefit. I mean, that, that's an amazingly homogenous result. Um, and the overall conclusion is more babies survive with no disability. Wait, don't do that to me. So for every six babies, one extra baby will survive and is completely normal. So we're improving both survival and preventing disability. It's not perfect. The other five are not, are not being significantly affected, but one in six. I compare that with, with treating lipids uh, for in heart attacks. It's, the, it's an effect size of, what, 250. Yes. There's a lot of people being treated with lipid-lowering drugs. And that's, that's normal, but you can also look, OK, what about the, the poor babies who have cere cerebral palsy, a severe motor disability, usually hypertonic, with difficulty releasing their movement? And you see, in, in total, 30% of the babies in our study had cerebral palsy, cutting down, being reduced by about 40%. Here's our comp the competing study from the National Institutes of Health showing exactly the same effect. So even the severe outcomes are being prevented. The challenge now is to find ways of building on that success. And I hate to admit it, for a long time, I have been the king of negative studies for some time now. Um, so they're, they're finding difficulty improving hyperthermia as such. It seems to, our initial settings seem to be perfect, but everybody is pretty convinced that cocktails are nice. Uh, adding uh, beneficial therapies on top of hyperthermia will event eventually help make it better. So here we've gone, from, this is a genuine picture from the 18, 1898 of a baby being resuscitated in cold water, um, but never, never going anywhere, to the definitive trials in New Zealand. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Ed Mitchell was born in Iran to British parents and trained in London and subsequently worked in the UK, in Zambia and in New Zealand. Indeed, he came to New Zealand in 1977, did his pediatric training here in Auckland, and in due course became CureKids Professor of Child Health Research at the University of Auckland from 2001 to 2015, and he's now a part-time professorial research fellow. His work on the epidemiology of sudden infant death earned him, amongst other things, a doctorate, a doctor of science from the University of London. And he's going to talk to us tonight on preventing sudden infant death, past, present, and future. Ed. Thanks, thanks, Jane. Um, in this uh, very brief period of time, what I'm going to talk about is where we were in the 1980s. Talk about the New Zealand cot death study, 
talk about the prevention program, which subsequently was called um, the Back to Sleep, the reduction in mortality, and about our current safe sleep program. But first, I need to just sort of talk about terminology. Um, when, we, when I started working in this area in, about, in the mid-1980s, um, we referred to this as cot death. Then we started using the scientific term sudden infant death syndrome, and now we're using the term su SUDI, or as the Americans say, SUID. And, and that means sudden unexpected infant death in America, sudden unexpected death in infancy um, here in the rest of, and in the rest of the world. I, I also admitted to say that um, the Americans didn't call it cot death, they called it crib death. <laughs> The, 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 anyway, in the, in the 1980s, um, this statement, SIDS is unpredictable, unpreventable, unexplainable tragedy, was, was being said all the time. And that, but this was the first reference I could actually find on it. And there's so many times that statement is made. So when we were looking at this in the mid-1980s, SIDS, as you can see here, in New Zealand was much higher than other countries, whereas the non-SIDS rate was actually very similar, running around about two per thousand. So our total mortality from all causes, um, and we're using the post-neonatal period, um, which is from 28 days through to the first birthday, is much higher in New Zealand, or was much higher in New Zealand than any, than any other country, and in fact was actually twice as high as that that was present in the Netherlands. What's more, that the post-neonatal mortality rate, that's the top line, had not changed over 20 years, whereas other um, age groups in infants, um, in children, had actually improved. But, our, but that crucial um, first year of life, there was really minimal improvement apart from in the neonatal um, uh, causes from the work of the neonatologists and, and better obstetrics. Looking at national data, w there was a really good description of, um, of SIDS cases. We knew that it was more likely to occur in males. It was more likely to affect low birth weight babies or babies um, that were born pre-term, um, infants of young mothers. There was a big winter peak, and disadvantaged communities, and, and particularly Māori, were um, overrepresented. And it's got a very characteristic age group, uh, um, age, age distribution. And um, this is <coughs> data that, um, this pattern of being sparing the first month of life and then an increase, and then two to three months being um, the highest rate, and by six months of age, 85% of the deaths have already occurred for, uh, from this cause. And even now, and all around the world, that age distribution um, exists and is still somewhat unexplained. So in the mid-1980s, we thought, well, we needed to do a, a study and try and identify what the risk factors for SIDS were with a particular emphasis on um, infant care practices. Why, why was our rates higher in New Zealand than um, in other comparable countries like Australia and the UK and the Netherlands? So we, we wondered whether we were doing things um, differently to other countries. So we did a case control study. So we, we compared cases with control infants. The cases were all ones that were certified as dying from SIDS. They were, we chose the post-neonatal age group, that's 28 days through to the first birthday. We ran it for three years, and in that time, there were 485 deaths, and our interviewers did a fantastic job interviewing these families and managed to get 81%. Um, we compared them uh, with living babies that were representative of all births, um, and, and we interviewed them at a time to produce that, that very characteristic age distribution. And we selected a, a 1,800 um, randomly sampled babies, and we interviewed 88%. Um, so this was a big study. Th that 800, uh, 485 deaths actually only came from 80% of the country, those yellow areas. Um, we just 
didn't have the resources to get to, a, to all the other smaller centres. Um, and this gives me an opportunity to acknowledge all the other, um, my colleagues that um, helped make the study a success. The key, one of the key factors, um, and, and certainly was the one that was most striking to me, and um, it was interesting that we started the talk talking about uh, Shirley Tonkin. She was telling me all along that it was sleep position was the problem because she was interviewing families and identifying these babies lying on, on their front. Um, we actually looked, rather than just relying on the position um, found, we also looked at the position last place to sleep. And in this time, 32% well, of babies were um, sleeping on their front, but 64% of the cases were placed to sleep on, on, on their front. And this increases the risk sixfold compared with going to sleep on their back. This was the first study that showed that side sleeping position was a risk. And I'll come back to that. Um, three other factors that were found. Smoking um, increased the risk uh, by 41%. Look at the smoking rates. 31% back in the mid 80s or late 80s. Um, not breastfeeding and bed sharing. Interest, and I'll be coming back to that. Bed sharing, 10% of ba babies were bed sharing. 24% percent, in other words, a quarter of the babies were dying in bed with a parent. This information um, influenced the Department of Health, now the Ministry of Health, to launch a prevention campaign. And this was some of the brochures and material that they produced. Um, and, this, and this is the very first pamphlet, uh, very first poster that they produced. And what we actually, um, you'll see underneath the figure, is place baby on side or back to sleep. Because it was the first study, um, we were unsure about what we should be um, recommending, apart from not going to sleep on the tummy. That message subsequently changed to back or side, and then eventually to back only. Two, two other comments about this picture. If you look at that baby, the right arm is right underneath the baby, and that baby will land on its face. <laughs> Um, so that's not very good. <laughs> um, and, but I did like the um, no smoking sign that was on the, bl on the blanket. <laughs> I thought that was a neat touch. We launched the campaign um, in, 19, in um, February 1991, but what you can see here is actually mortality had dropped quite considerably the year before because we'd spent so much time talking about it, people were actually changing their behaviours um, uh, in the year before. The grey area is the SIDS mortality, um, and you can see that where we were running at four per thousand, um, by 1992 it was um, only a fraction over two per thousand. And the white is the post-neonatal mortality from all causes, so th which showing a similar drop which shows that this isn't just an artifact of calling it something else. This is, this is real. Um, in, in 2019, um, Pete Blair from the UK and I sat down and, tr back of the envelope stuff, tried to calculate how many babies this simple intervention had saved. And we calculated um, then that 3,000 lives had been saved in New Zealand, 17,000 in England and Wales, and 40,000 lives in the, in the US. Um, so this is sort of, if, uh, in effect, bigger than immunization. Finishing with um, bed sharing, the, the, as I showed you, 24% um, 20, of babies were dying in, a, in bed with a parent. Um, that risk was identified in other studies. The risk is actually much higher if the mother um, smoked in pregnancy and the baby, we think that's because the baby was damaged by the smoking and doesn't respond well. The, since the reduction of deaths from prone sleeping position, bed sharing now occurs, uh, sorry, bed sharing now accounts for over 50% of all our uh, sudden unexpected deaths. Um, the problem is, is being advice not to bed share has been somewhat controversial. Indeed, some uh, groups have been promoting bed sharing for um, improving breastfeeding rates. 
Um, the, big, the big advance we had here was um, David, Dr. David Tiffany Leach, who developed the Wahakura, uh, which is that in the bottom one, which is a woven basket, um, which, allow, which allows the baby to be taken to bed with the parents, but in their own safe sleeping area. Um, the problem with the Wahakura is it actually needs a skilled weaver to actually make it, otherwise the sides are floppy and that when the mother or father uh, leans against it, it collapses. The next big advance uh, was um, the Pepipod, which was developed by um, uh, Stephanie Cowan in Christchurch. And this is a sort of plastic box, origin, um, a plastic box. Um, it's not as attractive as the Wahakura, but it can certainly be produced a lot more quickly and easily. And what, what we've seen, um, and we reported this to, um, a couple of years ago, is that the mortality rate, has, um, and that's the middle line over the whole country, has actually dropped by 30% um, since uh, 2010 through to uh, 2015. But what you see there, the top line is our Mari rate. This, whereas the rate had been pretty constant at just over four per thousand, there was a substantial drop um, which has been maintained in, in the Māori community. And of course the Waiakura and Pepipod and uh, co-sleeping um, is very important in that, in that group and has been really effective. So I started off by saying SIDS is un unpreventable unpredictable and unexplainable tragedy. The only, we've, we've basically shown that it, it's preventable. In the mid 1980s, we had 250 deaths a year in New Zealand. By 2010, it was 70. Currently it's 45, and we estimate we can get down to six to seven if the advice is followed. Um, is it a, the only state part of the statement I accept is it's a tragedy. And that's because uh, sudden infant death is preventable and avoidable. Thank you. Associate Professor Justin O'Sullivan is the Associate Director for Research at the Liggins Institute. His research centres on understanding genome biology and his goal is to interpret the relationships between what the cell's DNA codes, that is the genotype, and what we actually see, that is the phenotype. His group specialises in integrating novel techniques to answer biologically important questions, including what is the physical structure of the genome within the cell, and what is the genetic structure of the genome within an environment. Tonight, Justin's going to talk to us about the microbiome and the lifelong effects of preterm birth. Thanks very much, um, and thanks to the AMRF for sponsoring this event. Um, it's always always difficult to come in and talk about these things, you know, because the work that we do, it's it's not me. Um, so there's a lot more to us than you see, and I think this is true true for all of us. So the work I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, actually work that's done by predominantly the group you see here. It's led by myself and, and Wayne Cutfield in the corner there, and, and predominantly done by um, Fellini here and Valentina and was funded by, by these people. So there's a lot more to us than you see. Um, our guts are really quite beautiful environments. Okay? Doesn't seem like it. Uh, but if you actually get in there and have a look around, um, they're actually quite nice places. <laughs> they have good nutrients. They don't have much oxygen. But they're quite attractive spaces to live in. So inside your guts, there are trillions of microbes. And in fact, the microbes that are in your guts actually are equivalent in number to the number of cells that you have that are actually of human origin. Okay? So you're roughly 50% microbe and 50% what you think you are yourself. So you're a walking ecosystem, okay? wandering around, 
breathing and eating, and basically you're feeding these microbes. But the microbes themselves they don't just sit there and live there happily, they actually communicate with you. Okay? And so for a long time we've thought along the lines of Cox postulates, which is that things infect us, they cause disease and sickness and things. But these microbes that live in you and on you are really important with respect to your health, your well-being, your longevity, your mood, and the way you develop. Okay? So, just like a city, your foundations are laid early. So in this map, you know, it's a map of Auckland City. Um, it's a pretty recent one. But in fact, this map hasn't changed a lot since Auckland City was founded. Well, there's motorways being put in and stuff, but predominantly, it's very, very similar. And so the foundations for the structure are laid very early on in the development of a city. And just like that, the foundations for you and your microbes are laid very early on as well. So that if we actually look at microbes, what we see is that when you're born and you come through the birth canal, you get a good dose of microbes from the mum. Okay? A lot of those microbes, though, and in fact, in your gut already as an infant or as a, as, a, as a baby as you're being born, you already have some microbial material which you got while you were actually in the womb itself. Okay? So the womb is not the sterile environment sometimes that we think. But as you come out, you get this nice dose of microbes, and it differs if you were born by C-section. Okay, obviously, you get a different sort of dose of microbes there. But over the first year of your life, you go through a period where your guts change from being sort of an aerobic environment to being an anaerobic environment, because when you're first born, you're quite aerobic. As that happens, the microbial community that's inside your guts changes, and it modifies itself. And so there's a period of your life over the first year where you have quite a lot of change in the microbes that are present in your stomach. But after a while, that settles down. And about the age of two to three, when you're weaned, effectively your microbes stabilise and the population stabilises so that you have effectively what you should have for a long period of your adult life. If you get diseases, and in this instance the picture is for type 1 diabetes, so people that have become type 1 diabetic and non-diabetics, what you see is that there's a divergence here in the microbe population. And that divergence correlates with the onset of the type 1 diabetes in these individuals. And similar things happen for different disorders. So we know that the microbial population you have in your guts and the diversity of it is linked to your BMI or your weight and to other factors associated with your health and well-being. But we know that that happens in a very short period of time. So what happens over an individual's lifetime? So we did a study uh, with Billy Apple. Okay, we, we won't go too much, but it was, he, he did an a, a, a exhibition in 1970, uh, which was called Excretory Wipings. Okay? So it doesn't take too much explanation to understand what that was, right? And so this, this display of Billy's, um, it got censored and shut down, um, which also, for some people, may not seem that unusual. Um, but it was censored and shut down, and Billy kept his material, and he kept it archived. Okay? And so a couple of years ago, Billy rocked on in and he said, I've got this material, can you do anything with it? So we extracted it. And when we extracted it, what we actually saw was that over Billy's lifetime, since he was a young man and he went through to now being an, an older man, over his lifetime, 50% of his microbiome has been stable. Okay? Which means that as in childhood, when it's established and it lasts a long period of time, it's stable. right? There's a bit of fluctuation in it, but it's pretty stable. That carries on right through into your later life, as Billy is now about 80. All right. So we know there are changes over a lifetime. Those changes can be thought of as predominantly maybe cosmetic type changes, like the uh, uh, subway artery and cycle routes that are being put into Auckland Central City. But it's really a city's industry that contribute to its identity. Okay. And so in this instance, we have you know Auckland on the left here, and, and we well, I was looking for boats, but this is what I could find. So makes a lot of kayaks and different things here because we live by the sea. Other cities you know, make maybe cars and things, and these cars contribute, and the factories that make them contribute to their identities. They contribute to the people that are there. If this is the case and you lay the foundations early, then that means that what happens at birth should affect you later on in life out here. And we know that preterm birth is a very, very severe stress on infants, on people. All right? You go through a period where you're getting parenteral feeding, you're being kept in an incubator, you're on antibiotics, a whole lot of things happen. So what we did is we asked the question whether or not what happens to you here affects the microbiome when you're way out here. 
okay, when you're childhood, at about eight years of age. When we looked, what we found was that we expected to see differences just like this. We thought, you know, term children will be like this, you know, and preterm children might be a bit like this. But in fact, what we found was that the microbiomes were the same. They looked the same. We couldn't tell differences between the preterm microbiome or the term microbiome. And this was kind of weird. We didn't expect that. Okay? But we know that like house prices, uh, microbiomes go through cycles of activity. Okay? All right, and right now, of course, our house prices are doing something like this. Um, but you know, that's OK. But the microbiome does the same thing. So if the foundation is there, but perhaps there are different organisms that are active. And in fact, when we looked in the microbiomes of the preterm and term children, and we actually looked to see which bacteria were working, what we found was that even though they have the same populations of bacteria, the bacteria that were active in the preterm children here contained some members of this family called Colonsella, while the ones that were in the term family had a whole lot of active allostipes. And this is really interesting because the Colonsellas have been linked to serum cholesterol levels, hepatic triacyl, uh, sorry, tags, um, less glycogen and glucose metabolism, so changes in metabolism. Allostipes, by contrast, have been linked to protein-rich diets, all right, which is kind of weird because, in fact, when we looked at the diets between our populations, they weren't different. So something else is going on. So if the active members of the population are different, then are the products are making the same. Well, one would argue that they shouldn't be. And in fact, if we look at the microbiome, we should see something like this, that the products being made in the preterm kids here, they have a lot more of certain things. And in fact, when we looked, we found that they did. We found that the preterm children were making a lot of arginine, okay? Heaps of arginine, there's green bars out here. And so the arginine that they're making is interesting because arginine is a conditionally essential amino acid. It's also something that we know that preterm children can't make when they're born, okay? And so they get a lot of supplementation for arginine. The genes that they require to produce arginine are not turned on fully in preterm children when they're first born. And so this is a really interesting thing, okay? That eight years on, after these children have left hospital, they have still got microbes that are making a lot of arginine. Histidine biosynthesis, histidine was also different. In fact, the microbes in the, in the preterm children were making histidine, while the microbes that were present in the term children here were actually degrading histidine, okay? which is really cool. So there's a big difference in these two things, arginine and histidine. There were also differences in a number of other products. And when we look at the variation in those products, and we look at the correlation with different samples, what we see are that the microbes here um, in the feces, okay, for the preterms, there was a correlation between the, the structure of the microbial population, the active ones, and some of the fecal amino acids, whereas in terms it was a lot less. Fecal volatiles, a lot here again, so microbes from the preterms correlated with the fecal volatiles we were seeing, but a lot less for the terms. When we look here at the plasma amino acids, though, we saw this, that the plasma amino acids, so in the blood, the peripheral blood, okay, the microbes didn't correlate with any concentrations for the preterm, but they did for the term. And here, the plasma volatiles, again, correlated with a lot less um, plasma volatiles and microbial correlations um, in the preterm than they were in a term. And this really is indicative of this happening, all right? That the guts in the preterm children, if we were to interpret this data, really should be leaking, okay? They shouldn't be able to maintain concentrations across, the, across them. And in fact, what we did is we looked at some indicators of this, and, and there's a good reason to think this, because Arginine as well, and the production of lots of arginine in your stomachs produces nitric oxide. Nitric oxide causes inflammation, which is linked to gut leakage. All right? A lot of reason to think this. When we look, and we actually look at products, uh, the actual product we look at is calprotectin, and calprotectin levels indicate gut inflammation and leakage. And what we see are that the preterm children here on the left have much higher levels, and in fact, there are individuals way up here off the chart that are actually uh, in, the, in the realms of having Crohn's disorder. Um, in this particular population. By contrast, the terms are much more condensed, much lower levels of calprotectin. So their guts were inflamed and leaky. The children born preterm also had reduced insulin sensitivity, which is really interesting. Okay? It correlated very well with the production of some of the amino acids that we were seeing, correlated with the short-chain fatty acids and various other things that we were seeing oops, in these individuals. So our current hypothesis is that the early life events program a change in the foundation flora which is in these microbes. And that change is not about the structure of the population, but it's about what the microbes are actually doing as these children eat, breathe, and live. 
And whether or not these differences influence or contribute to the changes in infant insulin sensitivity remains unclear to us, but we're trying to figure out ways to move forward and understand if we can interfere with this process. So when you think about the microbes in your stomachs, okay, it's not about us and them. It's not about labeling them so that they're things that you should fear. Rather, they're a part of you and you should embrace them. Okay? <laughs> Hopefully they're not that big. Um, again, um, there's more to us than you see, and these are the people who did it, and these are the current people in my group at the moment. Thank you very much. Distinguished Professor Jane Harding um, is currently a researcher in the Life Path Research Group in our university's Lingen Institute. Uh, Jane did her basic medical training here in the University of Auckland and then a Doctor of Philosophy in Oxford in Britain and then a postdoctoral Fogarty Fellowship at the University of California in San Francisco. She's undertaken uh, teaching and research in this university for much of her career. Her ongoing research concerns the role of nutrition and growth factors in the regulation of growth before and after birth and the long-term consequences of treatments given around the time of birth and the regulation and significance of neonatal hypo hypoglycemia, that's low um, blood sugar levels. She's a paediatrician and she's practiced as a specialist neonatologist caring for newborn babies at uh, National Women's Hospital and has just recently stepped down from her role as the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research in the University where she had overall responsibility for the university's research activities. She was awarded the Howard Williams Medal by the Royal Australasian College of Physicians in 2014 for her outstanding contribution to paediatrics and child health. And in 2016, she was awarded the Bevan Medal by the Health Research Council of New Zealand for excellence in translational health research. So Jane, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Low blood glucose hypoglycemia is a really common problem. We estimate that it's affecting more than 10,000 babies a year born in New Zealand, and it's probably the only really common and readily preventable cause of brain damage in newborn babies. And that's because glucose is the major fuel for the brain, and of course babies have relatively big brains, so if your glucose levels are low, your brain has a problem. Why on earth do babies get low glucose levels? Well, very broadly speaking, this is in term babies in the first few hours and days after birth. And you can see that at the time of birth, babies have highish glucose levels. That's because they get a constant supply of glucose across the placenta from the mum. The mother's glucose goes up, then the baby's goes up. And mother's goes up with the stress of labour and delivery, and so the baby's goes up, and then somebody comes along and cuts the cord. So now the baby has a problem and the glucose levels fall because they still need glucose for their brains. And it takes them a few hours. You can see the low point is around one or two hours of age. It takes them a few hours to get themselves sorted out, start making glucose of their own, start feeding and sort out their glucose levels. And they come up, they don't really come up to normal adult levels until about day three or thereabouts. But because we don't know which babies are going to have low glucose levels, and we can't tell from looking at them, we end up doing blood tests to look for glucose levels in the babies who are known to be at high risk of low levels. Who are those? They're the big babies, the small babies, the babies whose mothers have diabetes, and the babies who are preterm and are sick for any other reason. And that turns out to be, if you add all those together, nearly a third of all babies fit into one or other of those categories. So we're doing lots of blood tests on lots of babies to try and detect this problem and prevent brain damage. So when we started working on this problem a few years ago, we asked every neonatal unit in Australia and New Zealand, we said, how do you treat babies with low blood glucose levels? 
And we used, this is just two of many scenarios we showed them, we said these babies, one's a preterm baby at 34 weeks, the other's a term infant of a diabetic baby, this baby's two hours old and it's got a low glucose level of two, how would you treat it? And when you get that many different answers, you know that none of them know what they're doing. So it was very clear at this time that we really weren't sure what the best treatment was for low glucose levels. And we thought, well, surely we could do better than that. And we set about doing what we called the sugar baby study. This is Deborah Harris's work in Waikato. And we said, could we use this 40% dextrose gel? It's a simple sugar gel. Would it work better than just feeding these babies to reverse glucose? low glucose levels in the first 48 hours after birth? And the short answer is it works really, really well. In the green bars, you see the babies who got the placebo gel, and in the white bars, you see the babies who got the sugar gel. It gets rubbed inside the baby's cheek, and you can see that treatment failure, which was defined as not getting your glucose up after two doses of gel, decreased from 24% to 14%. Being admitted to the intensive care unit for treatment of low glucose levels went down by a similar amount. The thing we were really worried about is what it would do to breastfeeding, because we know that giving babies stuff other than breast milk is inclined to inhibit breastfeeding. So it was a great relief when we asked how these babies were feeding two weeks later that the rate of formula feeding was much reduced in babies who'd got dextrose gel. I presume because they didn't go to intensive care, which means they got to stay with their mothers and got to breastfeed. So dextrose gel looked like it was a great treatment. It's very inexpensive. It's non-invasive. It's easy to give. You can use it almost anywhere. This was published in 2013. And for once, the medical profession actually latched onto this and changed practice really quickly, because usually it takes years and years and years and years to change practice. And this is just in the first three years after that study was published. This is just an example. Five different places reporting, all of them reporting that the babies were less likely to be admitted for intensive care. And those who reported it said that breastfeeding was improved. So it's a very exciting example of how when a treatment is simple and easy to use, and seems to people to make sense that they do start using it. And it's very reassuring for us because there's not yet been another trial. And previous speakers have talked about the importance of multiple trials. Well, there hasn't yet been another trial. Everybody's just using it. But they are all reporting the same effect. We went on to do a cost analysis. And this is Matt Glasgow, who's doing his PhD on health economics. And amazingly enough, it even saves money. It saves about $1,000 per baby. That would equate to nearly about $8 million a year in New Zealand, we think, if all those babies were treated, mostly because it keeps them out of intensive care. But the critical thing that we still don't really understand is which of those babies who we are treating would have had brain damage. How low does the glucose have to be for how long for those babies to have brain damage? Do we really need to test all of these babies and treat them all, or would some of them be okay? And we thought, well, surely we could answer that question. And we hypothesized that development of children is related to the severity, duration, and frequency of low glucose levels when they were babies. And the reason the different ages are crossed out is we saw them at two, and then we said, oops, better see them again at four, oops, better see them again at nine. This is 614 children born at risk of hypoglycemia in the Waikato, have grown up and traveled all over the world, but we're still finding them. What did we find? Well, when they were two, there was no relationship that we could find between the low glucose levels and their development. And I didn't know whether to be disappointed about that, because that wasn't the hypothesis, or to be really pleased and say, well, we treat them all and they're fine. But it wasn't quite that simple, because when we saw them at four, in fact, they had a two- to four-fold increased risk of problems with visual motor function, that's understanding what you see and coordinating between your eyes and your motor system, 
an executive function, which is your capacity to short-term memory, learn rules, follow instructions, pay attention. Those two things together are very strong predictors of how children do at school. So our prediction at four years that these children were going to have a problem at school. So we're seeing them now at nine years, and I'll tell you in another year or two whether they do have problems at school. The worrying thing was that that increased risk was there even if they only had one low glucose level. And if it is true that there's a bad problem after only one low glucose level, then all the best treatment in the world is not going to help us. And about the same time as we were finding this, the Arkansas team were finding something quite similar. They had looked at babies. They tested all babies in the hospital. We only tested babies at risk. They tested all the babies in the hospital and looked at whether they were proficient, which means at grade level, in fourth grade, when they were about 10. And the odds of being proficient were about halved in babies who had a single low glucose level. So we've moved on from treatment to say, well, should we be doing something about trying to prevent low sugar levels? And if dextrose gel works so well to prevent low sugar levels, could we use it to prevent this problem? And usually when I go to work and say, I've had this bright idea, guys, everybody go hides and groans and tries to keep out of my way because the first question was, well, is there a dose of gel that could prevent low glucose levels? What dose are you going to use, Jane? I don't know. Better do the first study and figure out if there is a dose that will prevent low glucose levels. The answer is there is. We used 440, 15 babies, and we do have a dose of gel that does reduce the incidence of low glucose levels. But who cares? Will only matter, won't it, if we can do something important, like keep them with their mothers. So we're currently doing the HPOD study, hypoglycemia prevention with oral dextrose. We're giving preventative dextrose gel to babies, and the outcome of that trial is going to be, do babies stay with their mothers and stay out of intensive care? We're recruiting 2,129 babies, which is quite a lot. But we're about two-thirds of the way there, and we hope to finish by next year. But of course, OK, it would be great to keep them out of intensive care, but what really matters is what happens to their brains. So we're also looking at them at two, and I expect we'll have to look at them when they're older. But at the moment, we're looking at them when they're two, and the first results are quite promising. So I don't do all this stuff by myself. There's a big team doing it, and lots of people who help support our research. And I will stop at that point and thank you all for your attendance tonight. A little flyer for the next public lecture. Put it in your diaries. You are welcome to come and talk to the speakers. We won't take questions because everybody's been sitting on hard seats for a long time. Please do come and talk to us if you have questions. Thank you for coming for this evening, and thanks to the AMRF for your support.